This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace to you and peace in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and welcome to worship at the First Presbyterian Church of Warminster and a special welcome to those who worship with us through WRDB FM radio. Our liturgist today is Linda, and our musical gifts are offered by Kathy Worth Balkus on organ and piano, and our senior choir, conducted by our director of music, Dave Sathra. With what shall we come before the Lord and bow ourselves before God on high? He has told us what is good, to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. Worship begins with the sounding of the chimes. Before turning to scripture, let us pray. Gracious God, as we turn to your word for us, may your spirit speak to us. Help us to be steadfast in our hearing, in our speaking, in our believing, and in our living. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 
This morning I'm reading from Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear what the Lord says, Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember how what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, and with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? The epistle lesson today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that it is as it is written let the one who boasts boast in the lord
Our gospel lesson is from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Today's gospel lesson begins what is commonly called Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in its entirety, it extends from the beginning of chapter five to the end of chapter seven. And over the next three weeks, the Sunday lectionary will feature major portions from those chapters. Now, traditionally, we call it a sermon, but it's much more than that. Some New Testament scholars describe these chapters as Jesus's inaugural address as God's anointed Messiah. And others compare these chapters to the preamble of our constitution, where Jesus introduces a vision of the community he intends to create. Matthew may have that purpose in mind, but foremost, he presents Jesus as a teacher of God's law, much in the style of Moses, who also spoke God's law from a mountain. And as a teacher, Jesus makes it clear early on in his ministry that anyone who would follow him must maintain the posture of a student. To follow Jesus is to learn from him, to be challenged and changed by the journey. In fact, that's what the word disciple means, student. Now, it helps to look back on what has happened up to this point in his ministry. He's been baptized by John in the Jordan. The Holy Spirit rests on him and compels him into the wilderness where he withstands temptation by Satan for 40 days. We'll hear that on the first Sunday of Lent. And as we all know, he passes the test with flying colors. Then he sets up his home base in Capernaum, a fishing village on the Sea of Galilee. And soon after that, he starts recruiting disciples or students, the first of whom are eager enough to leave behind their day jobs as fishermen to make a go at this fishing for people business. And no sooner than they do that, than they see Jesus land a huge catch. And Matthew describes it this way. Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness among the people. 
So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, and paralytics, and he cured them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. In other words, as Matthew tells us, Jesus is immensely popular. The disciples must be pleased to have chosen to follow him because based on his early success, it looks like smooth sailing from here on out. The crowds keep growing and swarming around Jesus like bees to a hive, following him wherever he goes. And seeing that he has their attention, he decides it's time to start some serious teaching. So he goes up the mountain, away from the crowd, but still within hearing distance. And with the inner circle of his disciples, he forms his team into a huddle. And I hope you get the Super Bowl reference here. The coach calls his team together. And this is what they hear him say. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. Blessed are they who are persecuted for pursuing righteousness. And then suddenly Jesus switches from third person to second person, meant specifically for the disciples. Blessed are you when you are hated and persecuted and slandered because of me. Rejoice and be glad. Now, Matthew doesn't give us the benefit of knowing how the disciples respond to this teaching, but I would imagine that at least a few of them are thinking of coming down that mountain as soon as they can and jumping right back into those fishing boats. And I'll admit it, whenever I pick up the Bible and read this passage, I think I'm supposed to get right away what Jesus means, that it's sensible and logical for him to teach these lessons at the beginning of such a well-received ministry. These are among the best-known verses in the entire Bible, what my friend and colleague Stephanie Anthony calls needlework scripture. You know, the kind that gets cross-stitched on the pillows or framed and hung on the walls of our grandmother's living rooms. We hear these verses so often that we assume that they make sense. But do they? The word translated as blessed in these verses is hard to understand in its English translation. The Greek word used here has a wide range of meaning, which includes fortunate, happy, privileged, and favored. But even so, it's hard for us to see blessedness in what he is describing, at least in the ways we tend to define blessedness. Barbara Brown Taylor writes this, this is a list of losers. The merciful who keep forgiving their enemies so their enemies can trounce on them all over again. The pure in heart who believe everything they hear and empty their bank accounts to keep crooks in business. The peacemakers who step into the middle of a fist fight and get clobbered from both sides. These are God's favorites, Jesus insists, not the effective, successful people of the world, but the ones who cannot even compete, who would not know success if it walked up and handed them a trophy. Jesus applies the word blessed to those least likely to be considered blessed or fortunate in the eyes of the world, the weak and powerless, 
the vulnerable and mournful, those who refuse to feel at home in the world and as it is until everything is made right, those who want to bring peace and reconciliation to the brokenness of humanity and the violence and pain it creates. The prophet Micah describes these people as those who do justice, who love kindness, and who walk humbly with God. But Jesus reminds us that to walk in that direction, we're more likely bring disappointment and rejection than success when we pursue what God requires of us. So we are tempted to redefine blessedness according to how the world defines it rather than how Jesus sees it. And we end up reserve, preserving the word blessed only for those times when we see that things are going well for us. Jesus' words aren't meant merely to comfort or to give a pat on the back for those of us going through a rough patch or who have had to take it on the chin from time to time for trying to labor for God's kingdom. Rather, he's extending an invitation to a way of life. The way of life he himself embodied, which is to strive not upward toward crowd-pleasing success, but downward toward service and humility. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in his letter to the Christian community in Corinth, that way of life runs counter to the world's values. And the world will judge that way of life as foolish and weak. Yet Jesus calls it blessed. When we dare to wrap our hearts and minds around that calling, the Lord does not promise us success, happiness, or popularity. What he does promise is his presence and his sustaining love. And all we can bring for the journey are empty hands, hungry hearts, and broken spirits, trusting in the one who nurtures us like children in need of comfort, mercy, and true blessedness. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen.
With trusting hearts, let us turn to the Lord with our prayers. Let us pray. Lord Christ, we pray for all who believe in you, that our divisions may cease and that all may be one as you and the Father are one. We pray to you for the mission of the church, that in faithful witness, we may preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. And we pray for those who do not yet believe, as well as for those who have lost their faith, that they may receive the light of the gospel. We pray to you, O Lord, for the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples. We pray for those in positions of public trust, that they may serve justice and promote the dignity and freedom of every person. We pray to you for the poor, the persecuted, and all who suffer, for those who mourn, for refugees, prisoners, and all who are in danger that they may be relieved and protected by you. And we pray to you for this congregation that we may be delivered from any hardness of heart and show forth your glory in all we say and do. We pray that our families, friends and neighbors, that being freed from anxiety may live in joy, peace and health. Holy God, you claimed our lives in baptism that we might die to sin and be raised with Jesus to new life. Each day, give us listening hearts and obe obedient wills to keep us faithful always in your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve our neighbors. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever.
Amen.